Hello, everybody. So thank you very much to the committee for inviting me to give this keynote. Um, I was asked to talk about some of the issues that we found in using the digital epigraphic data in the Latin Now project. And I thought, oh, that, yeah, that's fine. I can talk endlessly about those things. Um, but I thought that would be a bit miserable. So um, I am going to mention some of the data wrangling issues that we've had that I'm sure you all know all about. Um, but I'm also hopefully going to strike a little bit of an optimistic tone in this keynote. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the Project Latin Now. And it's only possible to have done what we've been doing thanks to the people in this room, and obviously some also online and in other places, people like Silvia Orlandi, Pietro, and others who laid the foundations for all of this work. And um, so this is sort of showing you some of what people from slightly outside the subject, so I'm not really a digital epigraphist, I just work with digital epigraphy, um, can do with your stuff, so thank you. Um, so I'll kick off with a brief introduction, where I'll tell you what this project is about, and then I'll talk you through some of the issues that we've encountered and then um, tell you about where I think from my perspective the field might be going and that's going to obviously be a bit pontificatory so you'll have to you have to just uh, swallow that a bit um, okay so the Latin Now project something I really do know a lot about so this has been going on since 2017 it's funded by the ERC as um, Tom just said and um, it, it is my baby <laughs> Uh, I've had two babies during the project, actually. <laughs> um, but it it it's um, been such a joy to run this project because it's a European project and it's had so many wonderful people from so many different countries involved in it. Um, and we struggled through the pandemic together and kept each other going. And um, it's been really inspiring in all kinds of different ways. And what's really nice is that everyone's gone on to doing their own projects in different ways and go on to other cool things. And um, that's been a real joy. Um, it's ending this summer and I'm not sure what I'm going to do then. <laughs> I'll, I'll be bereft. So it's a project that is trying to think about life and languages in the Roman Western provinces and principally the Iberian Peninsula, the Gauls, the Germanies and Britain. We did also try and cover Noricum and Raetia, but we realised we'd bitten off way more than we could chew. Um, and at the heart of what we're doing is an appreciation that there's this complex nexus that is... Um, <laughs> is relevant for all people, all times and places everywhere. It's not a simplistic one-to-one -one thing, but languages, identities, and cultures are always linked in some way. Um, so in order to do this project, um, it's interdisciplinary and um, it combines social linguistics, epigraphy and digital epigraphy, of course, and archeology span to write a kind of social history. And I'll tell you a bit more about the interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity in a moment but in order to tell you what it is that our research questions are I'm going to give you two maps maps are problematic of course for being overly schematic um, but what we're interested in is really the black line in between them so these maps were made by Peter Huto who's sitting um, at the back there for our touring exhibition and the first one shows what's happening in the Iron Age where there's a really complex mosaic of local languages and in some cases epigraphies but not in all cases Britain for example doesn't have any written writing before Rome um, and then on the right there you've got after Rome in the post-imperial period and we can't say post-Roman because of course some people in that area still thought they were Roman in various interesting ways. And um, we're interested in what's happening in that gap between those two maps. Um, how is it that these, the linguistic and epigraphic landscape was so radically reconfigured um, over that time? So here are our research questions, or at least some of them. Latinization is basically at the core of all this. Um, and you'd think, oh, well, must have already dealt with that some time ago but actually funnily enough ancient historians have rather taken it for granted and it turns out when you try and tease it all apart and look at the modalities it's it's really kind of interesting so we're interested in the nature of latinization the nature of the spread of latin so why is it spreading how is it spreading how does education fit into that where is it spreading when is it spreading who does it involve how long is the process taking what kind of domains is Latin being used in and why are some communities, some individuals and so on and so forth, not taking it up? And we're interested in correlating those linguistic, uh, that linguistic change and maintenance with a range of other social variables, what we call our social factors data, which I'll show you later. Um, 
And I must say that it's really important to remember that, of course, Latin is not monolithic. Some of you in this room will know that very, very well. Um, so we're looking at all the kind of regional complexity of Latin, social complexity, change over time, etc. And my own area of particular interest is in biomultilingualism. So that's obviously featured quite highly in this project and also the fate of local languages. Um, you might be imagining at this point that another big part of our project is literacy, because whilst we can use testimonia and we can use later phases of languages to think about what history, historical things that, you know, what, um, what the process of those languages have been through and what that means about language contact, basically a lot of our evidence for the Roman period is, of course, written, and that means we are dealing with literacy, whether we like it or not. Now, um, those of you who have followed the literacy debate will know it all goes back, well, a lot of it goes back to William Harris in uh, the late 80s. Um, and uh, there's been, since William Harris's amazing book, Ancient Literacy, there has been a barrage of attacks, sort of nitpicking away at his book. And one of the things that people get most irate about is the fact that he um, assigned percentages of literacy to the different provinces. And we wanted to break away a little, rather than fighting over it and, and giving revised um, percentages for provincial literacy, we just want to break out of that altogether and think about social literacy in a way that we think about social linguistics. So um, the, the variegation and the complexity and drilling right down into contexts. Now, in order to do the kind of literacy, sorry, I keep getting too close. I'm not used to using microphone. Um, in order to do that kind of perspective as well as we can, we take a really broad view of the evidence that is relevant. Okay, so we're obviously interested in everyday writing, so the scraps on pottery and other things. And we had um, someone on our project, Mon Morgan Andria, working on the graffiti on pottery from the reserves in Lyon. And she found about a thousand unpublished graffiti just from that one site. Um, and we also are very interested in writing equipment. Um, so often written texts don't remain in some contexts, but we might uh, be able to find writing equipment in those. So it's important that we coordinate different evidence. And the problem is that on a very broad scale, coordinating things like writing equipment is really hard because not everyone's been interested in it. We've been interested in co collecting epigraphic remains, particularly lapidary epigraphic remains for a very long time centuries indeed. Writing equipment has been a bit more overlooked and some provinces where there's less cool Roman stuff like Roman Britain and I'm going to regret saying that, um, <laughs> people have collected uh, writing equipment and small finds much more rigorously um, so we have really good data sets for it but in other places where there's so much lapidary epigraphy and so much other cool stuff they've been a bit more overlooked and it's been dependent on whether there's people who've been sp specifically interested. For example, um, Oriol in Catalonia and uh, some guys in Merida or over in um, Augst and other places. There's been, there's been hotspots of activity, but nothing province wide. So sometimes we have to go into a lot of detail. Um, and one of the places where we're going into a huge amount of detail is actually in Vindolanda, which you'll have heard of because of the writing tablets. Um, but actually, there's a huge amount of evidence for literacy that's never really been mapped properly. So Anna Vili, one of the people on the Latin Now project who's online, I think, um, has been working with the archaeologists there to contextualise every single find. And there are hundreds of bits of writing equipment from that site, as well as the writing itself. And one of the questions there, and some of you may think this is very interesting, others will be like, what are seal boxes? But seal boxes have traditionally used, been used as proxies for literacy. Um, but people in Britain have said, oh, well, actually, maybe they were used to tie money bags um, and therefore wouldn't be so directly linked to literacy. So looking at a site like this where leather is preserved perfectly, we might actually get a bit closer to some answers for that kind of question. Um, on the subject of stylus tablets, in fact, we're also a text creating project uh, because we've been working with some wonderful people all across um, Europe to look, for example, at stylus tablets. And there are about, there are several hundred stylus tablets that are unpublished from Vindolanda. Of those, about 25% have some form of literate writing, you know, scratches on them. And of those, a smaller percentage can be read, but they can't be read easily with the naked eye, thanks to for all kinds of reasons, palimpsest and, and just the quality, you know, because it's very barely scratched. Um, and we have to use tech. So we have to use reflectance transformation imaging and other tech, other imaging techniques to try and read them. And one of the cool things, I'm not going to tell you what the exciting text coming soon is. 
uh, I might tell you over a beer. You can <laughs> wheel it out of me. Um, it's unpublished. We're working on it. And when it comes out, it's going to be really cool. Um, but Anna um, Billy um, has got her own project after the end of Latin now, uh, which will start um, in September, which is all about an object based approach to the stylus tablets, taking into account the materiality of them, the affordances, the wear marks and correlating that with when we do have the text and trying to make sense of how they might have been used. So let me tell you a little bit more about how we coordinate all this stuff and um, zoom in on one type of object to tell you about how we do interdisciplinarity. So, okay, don't yawn. <laughs> so interdisciplinarity is something that a lot of people say they do, right? And it, but it's actually quite, um, it's actually quite hard. And I think we try to do it on, in, in my project in two different ways. Um, one is just the basic thing of collecting data from different disciplines. Okay, sort of basic interdisciplinarity, I suppose. So we use social linguistic data and we use epigraphic data and we use archeological data. I mean, epigraphy is archeological as well, but the writing equipment, settlements, et cetera. And we coordinate like, all that evidence together. But we also try to take the perspectives of those different disciplines and the methodologies of those disciplines and try to integrate them when we're working on this material, because I feel like that gets us, that allows us to squeeze the most that we can out of the material that we have. So I'm going to give you an example of the inscribed spindle wells from Alta in Eastern Gaul. Um, I think they can be looked at in various different ways, and I think the best way is to coordinate all these three. So the epigraphic view, how might an epigraphist look at this material? This is, I should point out, it's those three on the left there. Those were replicas that we had made for our exhibition. Well, um, an epigraphist might say, you know, what's the position of the writing on these worlds? How is it, what's the execution method? What's the shape of the letters? Can we date anything from the, that shape? Um, they might say, uh, can I find other examples from across the empire? The answer is no. Um, they might say, what other epigraphic information might I draw on to work out other things? So that's why I looked for the funerary monuments of spinning women. These are the people that use, this, uh, use these implements from um, Altan as well. And what else might be, we might also ask what the text types are and uh, how similar text types might be used on objects elsewhere. There may be other things, of course, that you'll think of. And then there's an archeological perspective and a methodology, which is sometimes quite different. So we might get deeper into the kind of GIS of them and plot them on maps. And we might think very hard about the context. Um, and we might think, okay, who's dated these previously? Okay, well, they say they date to this date and that's because they've got Gaulish in and they think Gaulish dies in X. But instead an archeologist is gonna say, actually, I don't really care about the language, what does the archaeological context for these objects say? And so I collected all the archaeological contexts and that allowed me actually to narrow the date of these down to 90 to 300, 235 CE. And an archaeologist might be interested in objects as objects. How, you know, how do they relate to the spindle? What's the related material from the sites? Um, how were they used in practice? A more feminological approach. So take that thing, what does it look like in reality when it's spinning, when it's being used? The spinners can't read it, right? So when are they supposed to read it? Who is supposed to read it? Who else is in the context that they're being used? Are there lots of people in these workshops? So the traditional view is that men gave these sometimes quite sexually explicit messages to women and that women are sort of, their agency is slightly erased in that context. So I think the archeologists would be keen on um, looking at agency in this case. And then there's the linguistic view, which is how I came across these in the first place. So um, linguists would say, well, what language are these things in? Some are in Latin, some are in Gaulish, the Celtic language of Gaul, and some of them are in both languages. So either code switching between the two, and then you get into bilingualism terminology, or, and this is when I got really excited, I think there are some examples where there are two languages at the same time. So the entire message created by whoever is creating these spindle wells can be read entirely as Gallic Latin or entirely as Gaulish. 
at the same time. And I don't think that's a problem to be solved. I don't, you know, a, a linguist or something might say, well, which one is it? I need, I need to know which one it is. The answer is it's probably both at the same time. I've written about this um, at length in a, in a book that Ellery Cousins has just published called Dynamic Epigraphy. Um, and I call those examples uh, trilingual text, and that's trilingualism in my view, because we can't assign it to one or the other. And I think that's deliberate. On the subject of sociolinguistic metadata, let me continue on that theme just a little bit longer. So um, I'm delighted to see so many linguistic posters uh, at the conference. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, when we started this project in 2017, we couldn't find any good way of automatically bringing in the social linguistic um, data from other projects, for example, Bella Adamic's project, because the, we couldn't align it easily. Because at that point, the wonderful TMIDs hadn't been deployed everywhere. So uh, we found ourselves in a position that we thought, well, we can't do this. We've got 180,000 records. We can't do this by hand. We need to encode all the features and all the places where there could be that non-standard feature, but it's actually standard, in order to draw the isoglosses and do the things and do the, the complicated analysis. This is sort of micro social linguistic data. So in the end, we picked half a dozen of my favorite ones that are relevant for language contact specifically, BV alternation and other things. Um, and, um, and we put them into our data set. But the thing that we um, tried to do really systematically, and I'd love your help on this, um, and that is um, tagging all our bi and multilingual texts. And I've already talked to someone in the room who might hopefully be able to uh, use this taxonomy, maybe, possibly. So you can see it in the drop down list there. Um, I think maybe John might RDF it for us as a little case study. That would be great. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty confident we've uh, managed to find all the texts, definitely all the bi version texts and quite a lot of the other texts in our data set that are relevant for bilingualism. So we've been working on this for a while um, and we're constantly trying to cope with the big picture, sort of empire wide context, provincial context, regional context, Kiwatas context, uh, you know, family group, right down to the individual um, and trying to uh, talk sensibly about what all of this information can tell us about life and languages. And it's all about the complexity. It's always about the complexity, isn't it? Interlinked social factors, entanglements, multiple identities, excrepant experiences. So that's sort of a David Mattingly type perspective, I suppose, um, and loads of regional specificities. Um, you can read all about the results because there's no way that I could cover them today, uh, as well as all the other stuff. And I do speak very fast as it is. <laughs> um, there is a, uh, three books coming out with OUP, one at the end of this year and two next year. Um, you can see them there. We, they'll be open access, free. Um, please contact me if any of those take your fancy. Marietta, Peter, various people in the room have contributed to them. So please let me know if you'd like to see a PDF of anything and I will very happily share it. Two of the major challenges for our research, which involve digital epigraphy, are uh, reading the gaps and scales of analysis. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of reading the gaps, archaeologists do this a lot, and um, I think we could probably do it even more. But what we have, we need to work out to what extent some of these data sets reflect in any way, shape, or form any kind of ancient reality. reality. Um, and that can be tricky. Uh, and it doesn't help when we've got gaps in our data. And sometimes this is because, not because the stuff doesn't exist, but because it's because of archeological practices, it's preservation, it's uh, publication, and it's differential interest depending on where we are in the world. It's only relatively re recently that some of the areas that we work on have, have got a small finds epigraphy really going. As I, I alluded to earlier, nobody cares about Britain, <laughs> uh, sometimes for good reason. Um, we don't have a lot of lapidary epigraphy. And so from very early on, we were collecting the scraps. Um, and so we've got a really good data set for Britain, but elsewhere, it, it, you know, it, it's a bit patchy. And so we have to think hard about understanding all the practices that might have formed those gaps and understand how to read them. Dating I'll come back to is a nightmare. <laughs> Um, scales of analysis is another thing that we wrestle with, and this is where I give you the digital epigraphic stuff. So 
our biggest area is that multi-provincial picture, um, the provinces I mentioned earlier. Um, and in order to have a data set for that, we're dealing with sort of big-ish data. It's not big in a social sciences kind of way, but it's big for us, right? Um, and we have drawn together material from all different directions for our epigraphic data set. So we started off with the Europeana Eagle Project, which was an amazing undertaking, collated all this material, aggregated from all these different projects, and fed that then to us in epidoc form. We then added into that um, uh, the British material from Scott Vanderbilt, because he was on my project and he works on RIB online. And, and then we set about adding all the Greek and the local languages, which was surprisingly harder than <laughs> I'd hoped it would be. Um, so thank you to the Hesperia project for all the data that we got on the Paleo-Hispanic material. Thank you to Isabel Velasquez and Maria Hastapos for the has the host for the um, Greek material from the Iberian Peninsula. Thanks to me for the Greek material from Gaul um, and for the Gaulish. Um, and also Colleen Ruiz-Duras, that I think is online, um, who uh, who's helped us with um, her amazing RIIG project. So that's the uh, Gaulish inscriptions um, online. Also, thanks to Karina Solomon, who gave us, who worked with me to do the Etruscan. Uh, what else? Punic from Jose Angel Zamora. What else is there? There must be some more things. Francesca Continua got the Noric and the Raritic stuff for us. So lots of lots of different people from lots of different projects um, collaborating to uh, make an Uber data set for all the languages, not just Latin. And then, like I said, we use some of Bella Adamic's um, work for a restricted number of features and that fed into, we worked heavily on the uh, geographical uh, associations as well. And we take an object focused approach, which is one of the problems as you're about to discuss us, discover. So a potted history of our wrangling with this data set. So our aggregated um, data uh, dates to 2017, and it was over 180,000 records from the provinces listed there. And that came essentially from four main projects. Um, then we set about a deduplication process, which had been started by Eagle, but we were carrying it on. Um, we used fuzzy text similarity things, Levenstein and other things to look at that. We did matching with TMIDs. They hadn't been in the original export because the, not all the projects had got them all. And so we had to keep going back and forth to try and hook everything up. We matched on different attributes. It was, looked very similar to one of the slides we saw earlier. We were trying out all those things on this data set to try and see how similar or not the text was, whether it was likely to be the same as another text record or not. And as Jonathan <laughs> told me in a very on honest way about two or three years ago, he said, I think, Alex, your project came about four years too soon. <laughs> Because basically, if we got that same material just a little bit later, more of the projects would have been linked up in, in, in different ways. So, um, and more of the tools and the APIs and all of this would have been available to us. So we've been trying to do things that now could have been done for us in different ways. Um, for example, use it, using this uh, TM bibliographical sim on, on all, all sorts of things. Anyway. So the great merge that we undertook, that we'd rather not uh, have undertaken, uh, we put it off and we put it off and we put it off and then we did it. And that's when we saw the quality of the data and all the different projects in terms of lining up between each other and also all the gaps. So we had hundreds of thousands of conflicting attribute values when we merged these records. And some of them were not actual conflicts. So some were stone in one project, stone limestone in another. Not a conflict, happy days, take the one that's more specific. But in other cases, they were actual conflicts. Project one says ceramic, project two says glass. Go back to AE and decide what it is. And you can see how those kind of things happen. And um, there were some cases where uh, corners can be cut, as I'll explain in a minute, but actually a lot of it just had to be done by hand. You can see why I'm interested in this. My kind of interdisciplinary approach means I care about the object. The object is the main focus. We weren't, weren't a text editing project or anything like that. So we, we, we cared about the, the object with the text. Um, one of the most worrying aspects of it was the geographical situation actually. And I hope that if we do bring anything to 
the digital epigraphic community. It might be through our places table where we've got um, we've got a lot of improvements to um, the georeferencing. Georeferencing, as you'll see, is essential to us because we use GIS. So absolutely everything has to have a coordinate, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, so with the georeferencing, we really had to do it. And we thought, well, if we've got 10,000 conflicts in the georeferencing, what are we going to do? Well, OK, so a couple of kilometers off doesn't matter for the purposes of the big data set. So let's just say anything under 10 kilometers, let's just let it go because that might be the outskirts of Lyon versus right in the center. And if we're going to do something detailed, we're going to zoom in and, and get it right anyway. So let's not worry about that. The other stuff has to be done by hand. All kinds of weird things were happening, homotoponyms confused, misspelled places creating problems. Uh, misreadings of AE where some someone um, where there is a reference to a place within the record but it's oh there's a similar thing here that kind of thing so all of this had to be undone when one was in the Germanys and one was in um, Seville or something there's something going wrong so we, we were going through this one by one even after we'd done all of that and we'd put all the merged attributes together in deduplicated um, and cleaned records, there's a lot of missing data. And that meant going back to AE, CIL and other archaeological publications to fill in those gaps. Now, some corners could be cut. So it's rare that a milestone is not on stone. Um, it's rare that altars are not made of stone. Um, but having said that, um, there's always outliers that make you think, oh, I'm really glad I didn't actually just bulk change those to stone because you suddenly find something odd that is in a completely different uh, material. And when you're going through CIL as well, you, you expect the odd bronze or whatever it is in there, but suddenly there'll be a, a sort of monumental ceramic urn <laughs> in the middle of a run of otherwise more stony things. So one has to be very, very careful. Another thing that we had to wrangle with was that we, in the end, we added about 8,000 non-Latin inscriptions to the data set um, of those languages that are there on the slide. And one of the problems we discovered was we'd made our own duplicates. <laughs> We've just gone through the great merge and got rid of our duplicates and then we're adding more and that's because you know, we think there aren't going to be Gaulish inscriptions lurking in our data set or Greek inscriptions lurking in there, but um, there are some Greek ones from EDH when it's bilingual and other things and Klaus Slavi has got some Greek ones too, but also Gaulish inscriptions were sometimes identified as Latin or Greek in the early days, so they ended up in CIL as well. Um, and that's a, that's an area where the different practices in classical versus non-classical was a bit unhelpful because um, from a non-Latin epigraphy point of view, we didn't always know what the CIL, CIL references were and so on and so forth. So here's, here's what it looked like. Um, it, it's got a bit skewy on Tom's computer, but Aggregated data back in 2017, those are the percentages of what we had, where the gaps were. Um, and that's what we've got today as I'm giving this talk. The only ones I'm not sure about are the starred ones. We have to triple check the epidoc to be sure about that. Um, those Latin now ones will go up a little bit. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, by a few percentages on the lower ones, but that's it. The thing that's not going to change, sadly, is the dating. Um, and I think there is, I was saying this earlier, we do have quite a road to run on the dating. And I'm hoping that if we can get in the information about the source of dating and existing records and how secure they are, then maybe AI can help us a little bit, possibly. Um, but also we need to be talking to archaeologists who know how to date this stuff. So there are literally tens of thousands of stamps and graffiti on terra sigillata in our data set. The, I'd say possibly none of them dated. But I worked on a terra sigillata project about 15 years ago, which is why I know all the stamps really well. and. Um, some of this stuff is dated within 20 years because they're the outputs of specific potters and they know where and when they were working. So if these are ante cuctorum signatures or stamps, we can date them. So we need to be thinking beyond our own community, I think, for dating some of this stuff. But that is a that is a hardcore 
plan. So five years in the digital epigraphic ecosystem, these are all things you already know, um, but, but few projects do define their terms and that does become a bit of a problem. We haven't defined our terms, um, but I hope we will do before the end of the project. Um, and as a community, we're still working on these agreed, uh, agreed vocabularies and ontologies and FAIR project is going to be finishing the work um, that Eagle um, so valiantly undertook um, back in uh, whenever it was 2015-ish. Uh, um, some projects have been primarily text focused. I'm sure you can think of the main massive one that is primarily you know, started off a text focused project. That means there is very poor metadata you saw from those results. They're a bit better now in those individual projects, but um, they're not great. Um, there is poor quality metadata out there in the object and context realm of things. And non lapidary material, as I've implied several times, is the worst treated by a long way. If I see instrumentum as an object type, um, that's not too helpful if you're doing a more detailed analysis. So just uh, um, we know this unique IDs, uh, RDF, LOD, that would be amazing because one of the thing, one of the problems with our project was that we had a static dump. So we had to keep talking to the different projects to get them to give us their data or, or whatever. Um, and that, uh, that, that makes various problems, of course. So Eagle allows us to do this work and is the reason, in a sense, why we're all here. Um, and I hope well, this community will keep going. And I know it's frustrating vocab creating those vocabularies and ontologies. It is frustrating, but we will get there in the end. So let me tell you what it is that we can do with this stuff. So our epigraphic data, that's our big data set from Eagle with all those additions of the non-Latin, non et cetera. Um, we put that into a database. We coordinate that with, quote, uh, this is the, come back to it, the social factors data that I mentioned earlier, coming from about 30 different projects. Um, so we're, we're coordinating data from a range of different places, not just um, epigraphic. So Anna Villy's been in charge of the writing equipment. Poor thing, because that was really, really hard. Um, Peter Hoot has been in charge of the settlements. Um, that was a bit easier, thanks to the ERC project, um, the 2K. Um, Rhodes has been masterminded by um, Scott and others. And, and, you know, so many projects were helpful um, in, in giving us their data and explaining how they made their data, which is uh, one big part of it. So we have a beta version of our GIS. Those of you that were at Kegel might have seen us all excited about it. It would literally just it just come out two days before Kegel. Um, and it's available online for you to play with. So if as long as you have the inscribed objects layer ticked, as it is on the slide, you can filter by lots of different things. It's beta. Like I said, the data is going to, going to be improved till the end of the project. Um, but it is a good way to start to think about coordinating different types of evidence and to see where you might want to go to do more detailed analysis. It's the kind of tool that students actually quite enjoy to try and identify what kind of projects they might want to undertake. So to go back to um, the quality of data, the one part of this map that is really, really good data is Britain. And that's because of Scott Vanderbilt, who's in the room today. Um, Scott's been part of our project since the beginning, um, and he's been doing Roman inscriptions of Britain online. And as part of the Latin Now collaboration, he's added RIB3, which is the second volume of Stone, the Bloomberg Stylus, the Vindolanda tablets. And he's about to release, drum roll please, the whole of RIB2, which is eight fascicles and 12,000 epidoc records. And those have been lovingly epidocked um, and checked, and we, we, we're, um, we're, work, we're going to be hopefully working with archaeologists to check them as well, make sure they're up to date. Um, and that will be really good object quality as well as text quality. And that's what is currently in the web GIS. So um, I, I'm confident the quality for Britain, even right now today, is really good quality because we've used his, his metadata directly. Um, and so, for example, to give an example of what you could do, you could say, well, I'm interested in the epigraphic habit in Britannia. So let's filter by stone funerary, for example, see what we get on the map. 
and then let's see whether this how does this coordinate with the military etc so you, you can click on fortresses and forts and you can zoom in and see exactly where the activity where the activity um, is. And then you can click that little printer button, which is circled in purple, and you can get a half a minute map. And now I have to I have to be honest here, we're still working on the rendering. So who was talking about clustering earlier? Someone was talking about clustering in their maps. Um, because there's a lot of dots, things cluster, but then of course, when you want to export it, you don't want them clustered into uh, one site necessarily. So we're still working on that with the developer. But this kind of mapping tool that you can literally just press buttons and, and say go for student PowerPoints and things like that um, is quite useful. So that's the funerary lapidary inscriptions against fortresses and forts. Here's something a little bit different. This is the writing equipment from Britain. And um, you may not be able to see that well because they're not the same colors and the same size, but I can promise you that the distribution is completely different. And on this map, um, you can see a lot of activity, you know, lots of writing equipment finds indicating writing and therefore because it's Britain Latin because they don't really write anything else with a couple of exceptions that I can talk about if anyone is interested. Um, but you know the M4 corridor as we might call it sort of uh, what, uh, the north southeast west of London all the way to the Bristol Channel is very active. And we want to know why it's active. So I'd say things like, well, there's a lot of villa activity, fancy villas going on in late Roman Britain in that area. So, I think, oh, let's filter it by date. Oh, we can't. <laughs> the quality of our dating isn't too great for the writing equipment either. A perennial problem, I'm afraid. Anyway, we need to be coordinating all these different data sets. So here's my pontificatory part. And um, forgive me, um, because I'm not in the field, uh, but uh, working to an extent within it. So I think it's great if we can continue to work as a community on the resources to create an ecosystem that has loads of variety on it in it, um, but is systematized. So that when we're talking about apples, we're talking about apples and pears is pears. Um, we don't want to have to wrangle in the way that Eagle had to wrangle, we had to wrangle, fairs having to wrangle. We can sort it out. One day we'll be like the numismatists and everyone will be happy. <laughs> um, I think LOD has just amazing potential and um, EDH and Frank is already working with RDF. Um, Fair's going to do some test cases with this. Once we get our triple stores, yeah, and when, when we're serving triples, <laughs> um, that would be great. Um, I can really see why for a project like this, if we'd had that from the beginning, how awesome would that be? Um, but, you know, text changing all the time, what we could do in 2017 isn't what we can do now. But the word of warning, I suppose, is that the results are only as good as the data we feed in. So the data in the projects that went into Eagle, were, it was very, very patchy, as I showed you. Um, so lots of projects didn't say what the object was, didn't even say what the material was. So unless we get that up to date, when, you know, the big gun AI comes out, you know, it, it, it's not got as good a data as, as it could have. Um, there's this point about the openness of the nature of the data, and what decisions projects have made. That's really important. And I have to be honest that we haven't yet published all our decisions. Um, I think very few people read those kind of documents, but they are kind of important. Um, but of course, you have to end up saying, oh, well, that 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 project didn't give us this and, and, and or the geo referencing on that wasn't so good. So we changed it. And that's awkward because you never want to say things about other people's projects in that way. And that's very, very difficult. But then other people can take your data and think there are no problems unless you set out all, all of those kind of issues. And it's really not just our community that struggles with things like this. Um, data reuse is a big issue in archeology. span There was just a Roman society talk in, in England the other day where we've got this humongous project, which we've actually used. We were used as, a, um, as an example of someone who had used it, but the rural settlement in Rome of Britain has published a stupendous amount of data. And they know who's using it because they can see the downloads and nobody's taking it because they don't know exactly how clean it is in different aspects. So um, we, we 
we need to communicate our results and we need to communicate what other people could do with our results. I think we also probably need to work more closely with non-classical epigraphists. Um, you know, the Colleen Ruiz Dorazes of the world working on Gaulish and other things. Um, they do really cool things um, over in uh, Ausonius and other places. Um, and we can work closely with them too. I know that epigraphy.info, I'm preaching to the converted here, but um, if this is going online, other people might uh, might see it. So yeah, so I think yeah, carry on that good work in trying to draw other people into this amazing community. Also collaborating across disciplines, as I've tried to show you, I was using data from all kinds of different archeological projects and things. Um, they've been doing cool DH stuff for a long time. We can talk to them and, and, and try to join things up. GIS um, has great utility if used to its full extent. And I'm not sure how much epigraphists do actually use GIS. We see the maps a lot, but GIS is, is you know, has a huge analytical potential, you know, how many inscriptions are this distance from roads or military things, or whatever it is, you can do buffer zones, you can do walking distance between different, um, you know, funerary epigraphy or religious epigraphy, whatever it is. Um, Peter Huto, I mentioned several times, he's the guy at the back there, um, he's got a GitHub course that you can take, uh, which is especially designed for uh, classical archaeologists and so on. So. Um, we, it doesn't use epigraphy, does it? But the GitHub, it has, is, yeah, okay. Okay, sorry, yeah, classical studies. A workshop specifically on epigraphy. There you go, everybody. Um, ask Peter for, for the link and, um, and, and try it out. And then also communication. So this community, is doing it, is doing the communication, is doing the posters, is talking to one another. I found out so many things today in these sessions where I'm like, brilliant, I can solve all my bibliographical issues and all of these things. So much stuff going on that we need to keep talking to each other and also support each other to keep projects alive. Um, this costs money um, and we need to support the projects who don't currently have funding and so on and so forth to try um, to, try to support them um, long-term. So the future, that I don't yet understand is my final slide. What time is it? Oh, good. I haven't talked for ages. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, so I put the yet question mark in because I would like to understand it, but I fear that my brain will not ever quite get what's going on here. But I do think that there is huge potential here. So this is the bit where, um, it's just mind boggling, right? Um, once we have overcome the issues with data interoperability and cleanliness that we still have, um, there's still gaps in a lot of material, then that's when we can bring in the AI and do some really cool stuff. Already Mark was showing us um, the value of AI, um, looking at the bibliography, st uh, bibliographic stuff, also John working on things like this. So the example, I guess, of, of the, uh, of of the potential can be highlighted by Taya's project. And I'm sure many of you will have heard Taya speak really well about this. She's teamed up with Google DeepMind and the kind of work that she's doing over really big data sets will give us the power potentially to think new thoughts about things like Greek colonization, Latin dialectal regionality, uh, the nature of epigraphic habits, the spread of technical knowledge, whether that's literacy or other things, stone cutting practices, uh, being able to do things like social literacy better, thinking about migration, all of those things. And we have to be aware, I think, and this became clear at Kegel, and I know I'm preaching to a group um, that is converted uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Some people find this stuff scary. I find it scary. Um, I find RDF scary too, if I'm completely honest. Um, so we have to try to make it as inclusive as possible. You know, we have to try and bring people. Some people won't come along with us, um, but we have to try to be inclusive. Um, and I think that our our work as digital epigraphists, if I can include myself in 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 the group here, is no threat to the field more broadly, because we can all coexist. And more than that, I think we can mutually benefit from all of this going on in one big field. So thank you very much, that's it for me.